Good to see you all. So let's go ahead and get started. My name is Jennifer Wilhelm. I'm a research and network coordinator with the New Hampshire Food Alliance. And I've been working with Chris and Edith and Rob and others on our climate action team. Um, we wrote a policy brief a couple of years ago. Chris is gonna talk a little bit about that and the work that um, we've been doing. But the Food Alliance has really centered climate change and its work and the climate action team is figuring out ways for the net, our network partners to um, incorporate that into their organizations as well. So part of why we're here today is to learn a little bit about what's happening at the national level from Rob, the regional level with the New England Food System Planners Partnership from Ellen and Sarah, and um, Chris will talk a little bit about what we're doing at the statewide level and then Edith is going to share with us um, what's happening at the substate regional level and her work with NOFA New Hampshire. Um, and then, of course, we'd love to hear from you what ways uh, you're getting involved with climate change work in the food system and any resources you may have action or connection to. Um, and then we'll share some calls to action ways that you can get involved. So we do have a tight timeline here. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Rob and have him introduce himself and then talk a little bit about his work at the national level. Sure. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, my name is Rob Werner. I'm the state director here in New Hampshire for the League of Conservation Voters. And um, I think what you're seeing on the national level with the Biden-Harris administration and um, Congress, both in the House and Senate, is really a renewed focus on investing in American agriculture for climate solutions. Um, this has certainly was part of the campaign last year in terms of messaging around climate um, and the various ways in which um, climate can be addressed and agriculture and farming is really an important aspect of it. As we well know, the, you need to build resilience in American farming and our lands, um, but we also need to figure out ways to, for um, soil health, restoration of soil, so that uh, that can continue to really be a part of the solution in terms of not only resilience, but um, carbon sink and, um, and regenerative farming, which has a, a really, I think, a much more acceptance and understanding even over the last number of years among the American public. And I think policymakers are really interested in, in building on that. Um, I think we're very lucky in New England, actually, to have some very good allies um, on the House Agriculture Committee in particular. Our own Annie Custer has rejoined um, the House Agriculture Committee. She was a former member. We have Chelly Pingree in Maine. We have Jim McGovern in, from Massachusetts. So we have a very strong regional um, base in New England on that committee, and they all share this, um, this aspect of really uh, appreciating the role of farming and agriculture and being part of the climate solution. Um, so you'll see that the Biden-Harris uh, administration is really taking an all of government approach and that really does include the Department of Agriculture. Uh, all of the climate work on a broad basis is really being um, operated out of the White House with Gina McCarthy and her deputy Ali Zaidi internationally by John Kerry. I think um, it'll be interesting to see um, uh, what comes out of the April 22nd Earth Day. There's actually, you might know, there's going to be a climate conference at the White House that will involve many, many sectors as well as international representation. And that's in part getting ready for the UN conference in November that was supposed to happen last November in Scotland. Um, and there'll be a big focus, I think, internationally on agriculture and these issues and how um, various nations are going to really up their ambition. That is the point. This is the five year mark after Paris. And so this, it's time for um, all of the actors to come forward with more ambition. And the United States is back on track and back in the Paris Accord, as you well know, um, in, in part of that. Um, so I know I only have a few minutes, um, but you know there are specific things that will be happening in Congress. Um, and as you see, as now that we're the COVID uh, relief package has been 
uh, passed and signed into law, you're going to see a renewed focus on broad infrastructure. And that means in the broadest definition possible uh, around climate and, um, and how that is part of that. And you're gonna see uh, ambitious uh, plans around agriculture coming forward. I think you might be familiar with some pieces of legislation that were introduced in the last Congress, but I think will be part of the discussion going forward in terms of uh, what our representatives have done. So you've got legislation like the Growing Climate Solutions Act, um, Chair Debbie Stabenow, Agriculture Chair Debbie Stabenow in Michigan is really interested in that. Uh, Agriculture Resilience Act, uh, Chelly Pingree is the lead sponsor of that, Annie Custer is on it as well as others. But I think there's a lot of interest in how do we actually create markets for to pay farmers to sequester carbon? How is it that we're going to support um, this financially? How are we going to make, how are we going to build incentives um, so that we're all pulling in the same direction? So I think you're going to see uh, a lot of work on that um, over the last, over the next couple of months. Um, on the state level, you, you, I think you're familiar with uh, Representative Peter Bixby's bills, uh, House Bill 199, uh, improve uh, support policies to improve soil health via the state soil conservation plan. Um, that bill did get an off to pass recommendation by a very large margin. Um, my understanding is the House is next gonna meet uh, for a couple days uh, in April, early April. So. Hopefully that bill will be coming forward at, at that time and then get over, over to the Senate. But it fits in well with what's going on nationally in terms of the emphasis and the conversation. Um, so reach out to uh, our representative, Annie Custer. I, I think there'll be a lot of opportunity for us to, to talk with her and interact with her in her position on the Ag Committee and around climate. So um, happy to be a resource and happy to be part of this uh, program. A lot happening and uh, it's a big departure, obviously, from what uh, has not been happening over the last number of years. So I'm um, excited about that. Thanks, Rob. And we'll, if you have any questions that come up during the presentations, please feel to type them in the chat. And at the end, we will have an opportunity for a Q&A. So I'll turn it over to Alan. Thank you all very much. Glad to be here for your next door neighbor over in Vermont. Uh, Ellen Kaler, I'm the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund Executive Director. Uh, we manage the Vermont Farm to Plate Program and on with me is Sarah Axe, who is our new part-time project manager for New England Feeding New England, which is actually a six state project uh, of the New England state Food System Planners Partnership, a mouthful, uh, but we are a group of backbone organizations across the six New England states that have been meeting since uh, 2013, somewhere in there, monthly as a way of supporting one another in developing state level food system plans and implementation networks. And we are very connected and nested within the Food Solutions New England effort that Tom Kelly et al. are uh, leading. So I'm going to walk through very briefly about this new project. We literally have just launched it within the last six months. Um, and there'll be opportunities for folks in, in New Hampshire to get involved. Um, the, the essence of the project is this. We will be working from the, um, the frame of Food Solutions New England, New England Food Vision of getting to 50% uh, caloric intake from New Englanders coming from products in New England by 2060, and we're dialing it back in terms of uh, having a closer in target of 35% regional food consumption from regionally produced, harvested, grown, caught uh, food by 2035. And when, as we are thinking about developing milestones across each of the six states, we want to make sure that that is that production increases are being done in a climate friendly or climate smart way. And so there'll be a component of this 15 year project looking at production practices um, that really reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the food system as well as sequester carbon. And then another component of it, which is a little bit nearer term that we think we can take advantage of um, because of the awareness 
by um, COVID-19 is to try to insert local food procurement into each state's emergency management plans and hazard mitigation plans. So I'm going to walk through a little bit about the why we're doing this project and then a little bit more on the what. So you may have seen this back in September of 2020. Uh, and you've probably seen other maps like it that really show the uh, impacts that are being projected for uh, because of climate change, whether that's water stress, wildfires in the, in the West, extreme heats in the middle of the country, or conversely flooding, depending on the year, uh, big, much higher rainfall events uh, in the Northeast, and then more hurricanes and bigger, more damaging hurricanes along the East Coast. All of that, then you take uh, the, the layer of the impacts of climate change that's predicted and you lay that over the distribution network of the way that food flows in this country. And you can see that here in the Northeast, um, most of our food moves up and down the I-95 corridor, which makes us very vulnerable when we have big, potentially have big events. And we saw this also, this concentration in the Midwest and also in California play out uh, with when during COVID in April and May with the uh, meat processing facilities uh, having to shut down for a while because of COVID outbreaks, um, you can see that, that with this concentration of where food is produced, these long supply chains, it makes us here in the Northeast very vulnerable because we're at the end of those supply chains. So if you take a look at uh, food that is produced in New England, for instance, uh, there is about 7.5 billion pounds of food produced in New England. 323 million pounds of that is produced in New Hampshire. Um, when you think about, and that, if you just look at just pure demographics of the population base, that equates to about 505 pounds of food that we produce uh, per person in New England and 238 pounds uh, in New Hampshire, as a for instance. Um, but if you take a look at that, so we don't, each person eats a lot more than that uh, in a given year. You take a look at the pounds of food that is produced in the region and you very quickly see that things are very co commodity focused and concentrated. In Vermont, it's primarily dairy. In Maine, it's primarily potatoes. Uh, and you take a look at the mixture of types of food across the six states uh, and you start to get some real uh, unevenness. And, and you also on the flip side see that there's some real possibilities because we could be producing much more of our food that we actually eat here in, in this region. And this is another way of looking at it for a population of 14.8 million people across the six states. You can see that, um, again, milk is very dominant as is vegetables, but of that vegetables, it's again, primarily potatoes from Maine. You think about all the types of food that, that we normally eat uh, and how could we be moving forward with increasing the amount of food uh, that we're producing from New England that stays in New England. Now, and, and here's a, a graphic that really shows what we're up against. If you take a look at the, that map that I showed of the distribution network of how food is flowing in the country, um, food is moving around in and out of regions. So the, the, to the far left, that 7.5 billion pounds is what we're actually producing in New England. But the amount of food that's moving in and out of the region is we're importing 71.1 billion pounds and we're, and we're exporting 66.2 billion pounds. So the question that we wanna really tackle with this particular project is what would it take to increase New England's food production circle and decrease the food imports and food export circles over the next 15 years? What would that look like if we needed to, if we really succeeded at shortening supply chains and increasing production of, of food and then keeping it here in the region? So this is a project, as I mentioned, of the New England State Food System Planners Partnership. Um, it is representative of the six uh, state backbone organizations, including the New Hampshire Food Alliance. And we do this very much in collaboration with Food Solutions New England and are nested, as I said, within that larger regional effort. So the goal of this project is to expand and fortify the region's food supply and distribution systems to ensure the availability of adequate, affordable, socially and culturally appropriate products under a variety of rapidly changing climate, environmental and public health conditions. 
um, what we are looking to accomplish over the next 15 years um, is to set, one is to set benchmarks for production by food category, uh, where we could then, each state could then be uh, aligning its uh, investments and implementation towards this goal of producing 35% of the food consumed in New England by 2035. Uh, each state would have adopted state and regional level policies, procedures, and plans that uh, enable the, a regional food supply that's sufficient to weather global and national food supply chain disruptions caused by climate change and global pandemics, is regenerative and climate smart agriculture and food system practices are promoted for farmers and food entrepreneurs, fishers and consumers, and that that is incentivized, that those practices are incentivized, and that the most carbon intensive practices are phased out and energy costs associated with food, not oud, sector operations are lowered. Uh, and then finally, we wanna ensure that the critical food supply chains that we experienced during COVID-19, uh, the, the challenges that happened during that time that, we, that they inform our future emergency management plans, adaptation strategies and tools. So what have we learned through this last year of having to stand up emergency feeding operations, seeing the, the brittleness and, and fragility of various national supply chains, and how can we uh, put in place more resilient uh, uh, initiatives, uh, policies, procedures, practices that really protect uh, the food supply here in the region. So our timeline um, is a 15 year one. We're, got, we're starting off in this first phase uh, this year, next year, more of a planning phase of really trying to develop uh, the benchmarks, develop a methodology for, for uh, identifying what level of food production could happen in each of the six states identifying and aligning, aligning partners and strengthening those relationships. Um, then we'll be moving into implementation phase uh, where we'll be setting priorities and really building out um, the, the initiatives, trying to raise the funding required to really put things in place uh, and then really be in major league go mode within, within five years. Because it will take time to really, uh, we, you know, we're looking at needing to, increase the, map, the number of acres under food production, for instance, across the region, somewhere in the two to four million acre range, four million was what was identified as being needed uh, with the uh, Food Solutions New England, uh, Vermont, the, the New England Food Vision uh, Plan. If we get to 35%, we're trying to, we're gonna be figuring out how many acres do we really need uh, to reach that 35% uh, goal. So as I said, three components to this project, uh, looking forward to figuring out ways that you all can be engaged in this work, both at the New Hampshire level, but also at the, at, across the entire region. Um, and I'll just uh, mention one thing that's connected to this uh, emergency uh, planning effort. We have a bill, uh, we have a section of a bill, it's in our agriculture house committee, uh, it was voted out unanimously and it's gonna be considered hopefully this week or next week by the full house. Um, we're not expecting any challenges to it, which is to ask, it asks that the Vermont Agency of Agriculture update uh, the agricultural annex to the state emergency operations plan that we have in our state and which every state has its own um, to have some language in there about maintaining a sufficient food supply during times of emergencies or other kinds of food security and to, to actually think ahead about how to plan for uh, food, secure, food systems security within the state, but also within the region, and would bring in the other key stakeholders to the process um, to just really start to work together to, to uh, use the emergency planning uh, apparatus that already exists uh, to the benefit of, of local food procurement, uh, especially during emergencies. So ways that you can get involved, um, we're, as I said, we're just getting started. So um, and there's be in touch with Jennifer probably is the most uh, ideal situation uh, from in New Hampshire, if you're from New Hampshire. Uh, if you're part of an, a regional organization like Healthcare Without Harm or American Farmland Trust, we'll be reaching out soon to engage with you to help us with the planning uh, process. And um, if you want more information, we literally two weeks ago launched a new website. Uh, and as I mentioned, Sarah Axe is our new project manager and that's the uh, website address. 
So happy to take any questions when we get there, but um, very excited about this project. It really brings together a lot of initiatives, uh, a lot of key uh, stakeholders will really help us, I think, align around uh, some very tangible on the ground uh, efforts that we can take to expand as well as fortify and um, uh, our food system and, and make it more resilient to all of these uh, climate related and pandemic related shocks that we know will continue to, to affect us. So thank you very much. Great, thanks so much, Ellen. All right, I'm going to share my screen so that I can turn it over to Chris. Um, thank you, Ellen. That was fantastic. Uh, Jen's been talking a lot about your work for several months now and uh, getting to see how it's kind of its maturity. It, it's it's excellent. And I look forward to how we can help. So my name is Chris Gogland. Um, I am here, uh, even though it says New Hampshire DES, that is not the case. Um, I'm not representing the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. Um, I'm representing myself. Um, I was born in Vermont and uh, been raised in exile and food has been something that has been kind of central to my interests my entire life. Um, and every 15 years or so, um, I seem to kind of fall into the orbit of the New Hampshire or the UNH Office of Sustainability um, to do some work um, that's in my kind of area of interest. But my general uh, kind of, I guess, specialty is in climate, um, although I do a lot of work with the energy system for the state, but this is not part of that. Um, but for the past couple of years, I've been working with Jen, uh, Jennifer, and then Aaron, as well as Tom, um, as part of the New Hampshire Food Alliance, um, kind of bringing up the a new group, the Climate Resilient Food Systems Team. And so we're gonna share a little bit of that work. It's gonna be somewhat duplicative of what you've heard possibly from Rob and certainly from Ellen, um, as I am a seventh grade science teacher at heart and can't help uh, but give a lecture as well as a presentation. So um, <clears throat> I'll be coming at this uh, a little bit more from just noting that climate has already been identified as a significant area of uh, threats, uh, both globally and nationally and locally. Um, the food system is particularly um, vulnerable, um, in part because we have a global food supply and the weather variations that we'll see across the, the world and the nation will vary, but we have been centering our food supply in those areas that are best tuned to provide uh, certain crops and certain types of animals. And as the food or as the climate changes, those areas may no longer be um, able to host um, those products that we've been we've growing there for a long time. Um, New Hampshire's climate has been changing. Um, and this is a kind of a well-known, well-observed fact. Um, lots of data that we've obtained from uh, nationally, but also from the University of New Hampshire, um, showing that we've seen changes in our particular climate, um, ranging from temperature to precipitation um, to rainfall and seasonality. But we've also seen, as anyone who has a farm, um, an increase in summer drought, so that even though we're seeing more precipitation, we are actually seeing more drought occur as well. Um, I am going to skip through some slides here. We will make this presentation at, available at the end, um, so I apologize. But some of the things that we're seeing is that we're seeing more winter warming. This has impacts <clears throat> um, on soil as well as uh, you know perennial uh, trees. And as the kind of, we may be seeing more disease come in as things that traditionally may have been killed off by the cold <clears throat> are, are not, but we also are seeing less snow cover which provides less protection for root systems as well as the soil itself as it may go through more freeze thaw cycles. Um, similarly, we're seeing more days above freezing. While this lengthens the growing season, um, we also have more ground um, that is exposed to very severe rainfall. Um, on the wettest days of the year, we've seen larger rainfall events in general. And so the most severe rainfall has actually on each day of the year has increased by about 75% um, over the past 50 years or so. 
Um, so this exposes open space, open land um, to greater potential for erosion and the loss of that critical resource that you know, supports agriculture. But with more wet days um, and more moisture it, on certain periods, we also have a potential for more uh, plant disease as well as uh, the diseases that uh, can affect humans and those that are working in the field. And that goes along with extreme heat. We're seeing more days over 90 degrees. Um, the increase in temperature both increases the speed at which mosquito and mosquito-borne illnesses um, can cycle through their life cycle, but then it also puts at risk um, individuals that are, are working out, out in the open. Um, I had worked in Maryland 20 years ago, and I remember we used to go into the cooler and just sit and try to like cool off. New Hampshire is becoming a little bit more like that climate. Um, and that puts the, those at risk of heat, heat illness. Um, but ironically, even though we're getting more water, we're getting water at the wrong time of year. We're getting more moisture falling during the winter, but we're getting more of it falling as rain. And so less snowpack is building up and even less is remaining into the spring. Uh, outside my house right now, um, where 20 years ago there would have been maybe a foot of snow, there's absolutely nothing in the ground is beginning to dry and the frozen ground is beginning to thaw. But any water that falls on that frozen ground um, as rain will actually just run off into the rivers or a greater portion will be, therefore losing what would have been groundwater that could have um, been used in orchards, um, irrigation ponds, or in the very soil itself. Um, is now lost permanently um, for that growing season. The, we've had droughts in 2016, 2018, and 2020, um, very severe in 2016 and pretty severe in 2020. Um, and at this point, we are actually behind um, for rainfall for 2021. And there seems to be a chance that we may be in drought um, in portions of New Hampshire uh, throughout this year. Um, there's that's relatively new information that I was reviewing this week. And so as Ellen was noting, or we uh, have very little food, um, relatively speaking, that is produced in New Hampshire. Um, we have about a two to three days worth of food supply on hand at any given moment. Anyone that went to buy food during the pandemic well understands that, um, but our production is relatively limited. Um, based on the about acreage that we have and the size of our population. And so that puts us at risk um, due to all of the things that I mentioned. Um, but there's another facet that um, we also may see historical food supplies be diminished by changes in the weather, but also changes in the ocean. Um, so this slide's a little bit out of order, but we are seeing um, changes in the Gulf of Maine where fish stocks are coming down for historically important fisheries. Um, as temperatures increase, as the acidity of the ocean um, picks up, but we're seeing new um, species come in. But we also, as um, was alluded to, we're at a risk because food growing areas around the country um, where we might import from or that might be important to uh, the, the, the meat and livestock industry um, are also under threat because of the extreme heat and temperature or drought potential that the country uh, may face. So this puts us with a relatively limited current supply of food production um, at the end of the pipeline. So the Climate Resilient uh, System team began to meet about two years ago. Um, we began to consider like what policies would create a more climate resilient team. Um, but what we ultimately settled on almost a year ago um, today was, or issue, was the policy brief that Jen discussed. And it had six guiding recommendations. Um, it was developed, the brief, out of recognition that um, we were in need of additional information that would help guide our understanding of what the food system would need so that we could grow more to support our state, whether um, during ex emergencies, um, where food supplies in other areas was interrupted, or just to make sure that the most vulnerable communities and uh, the population at large had access to healthy local food. We hired an intern through the UNH Sustainability Fellowship. Um, they met with about 30 individuals or interviewed them 
um, and then also did surveys and submitted a 22-page report. One of the things that they identified was a definition of a climate resilient food system for the state of New Hampshire that we can work with. Um, notice, noting that it's a resilient system is one that in the face of climate disruption is reliable across the supply chain from the production to distribution, ensuring adequate food availability and access for all populations and is centered on racial equity. So this was drawn from those 30 interviews and the 52 surveys and then um, polished up over the past year. And that report that this is in should be coming out shortly. Um, but to achieve that definition and that outcome, uh, two complementary high-level recommendations were identified. And the first is that integrating considerations of climate change and resilience um, within food system planning and policy development. But the second, um, goes well with what um, was mentioned at the end of the last presentation, that we should be integrating food, to food system considerations within and across all elements of state and regional planning, such as emergency and hazard mitigation planning. How do we make sure that there are adequate food supplies in the state, for instance, if Highway uh, 95 is severely impacted during uh, catastrophic flooding, um, or if power goes out and but at a level that is on the scope of 2008 um, ice storm where long-term storage is compromised because the distribution system is down um, at a level that uh, is at you know weeks long outages in certain areas. So how do we build it in and make it part of our everyday planning at all different levels? Um, but we noted that there's an opportunity for action in New Hampshire. And so those opportunities are going to vary um, because the food production and food distribution are going to be e uh, each impacted differently. And so uh, whether you're a producer or you're a distributor or you are in between and helping make sure that food is equitably distributed across the landscape um, or, or across time, uh, there's different elements that we'll, we'll need to consider. We don't necessarily have those answers yet. <clears throat> and so this is a little bit repetitive. Um, and in the interest of time, I just wanna kind of note that, so areas of engagement um, that could be taken um, are to incorporate a climate lens within your individual group or organization. Um, so considering how uh, the impacts of climate might directly influence your operations or your goals over the short and long term, but then also consider how they might indirectly affect them. Like what are the things that might happen inside the state or outside the state that aren't directly connected to your operations, but over the long term and short term may affect your operations, but are related to how climate may um, change at all different scales. And then also, rather than engaging in kind of that thinking and strategic planning, um, who can you partner with? Um, are you at a level where your organization should be working with regional planning commissions, the RPCs? Are there regional food hubs that are beginning to form and you can begin to work with them or like the maps that were talked about this morning, um, can you use those new tools to identify uh, food banks and maybe shelters in your area that you wanna make sure you're coordinating with uh, and then there's also consider volunteering with you know, the climate resilient food system, even if it's not directly, but making sure you're staying in touch so that you're feeding us information about what we might need to be doing to support your work um, or taking on some of that work as it grows and matures. And that was entirely too fast, but um, we can take questions and there will be a longer version of this presentation made available at the end. Thank you, Chris. Yes. So we'll turn it over to Edith. Thank you all very much for inviting me. It's a privilege to speak with you today. It's so interesting to hear the large scale version of, of what is, is happening in our region. And now we'll really look at the on the ground sort of um, activity. Um, I represent, I'm the Vice President for Northeast Organic Farming Association of New Hampshire. That's NOFA New Hampshire. It's a 501 C3 nonprofit with a 50 year history of cooperation between farmers, eaters, and our precious earth. 
Our goal is to help people build just sustainable local food systems by actively promoting organic, agroecological, gardening, eating, farming, and land care practices for healthy communities. Organic means by definition, growing food in living soil, having biodiverse farmsteads and not using synthetic nitrogen fertilizers and persistent synthetic pesticides. We're committed to regenerative organic production here in our region, not industrial scale faux organic, which is another story for another time. At NOFA New Hampshire, we take very seriously the 2019 report from the UN about the fact that industrialized agriculture with its long chain commodified distribution systems is responsible for at least 37% of annual greenhouse gas emissions. With this in mind and in our hearts, we're working really hard to support a different paradigm for agriculture, one that offers proven ways to help heal and restore a damaged biosphere, even as it revitalizes communities and biodiversity. We're advocating for a relocalized, humanly scaled, regenerative organic model of production and eating. We see this as an antidote to the current climate destabilizing, extractive, and agrochemical based food system. So how are we supporting this alternative model? Well, first we try to make sure that our local organic farmers can learn more from one another and find good markets for their products. For this purpose, we organize and fundraise for farmer to farmer education and networking through craft farm tours. This is a peer to peer model that's very effective in transmitting proven techniques for soil care, growing food and building solidarity among farmers as well as understanding among customers or co-producers to use the important slow food term. And recordings of our craft tours from 2020, six of them are on um, our YouTube channel and you'll see some uh, excerpts from them in these um, photos that we have here. We fundraise and coordinate a farm share program that has provided subsidized CSA shares to 250 food insecure families since 2017. In 2020, we helped initiate the New Hampshire Feeding New Hampshire program, a collaboration between New Hampshire Food Alliance, New Hampshire Food Bank, NOFA New Hampshire and the North New Hampshire Farm Bureau. And this program facilitated paid contracts to 170 local farmers for 40,000 pounds of produce, meat, and dairy delivered to 77 local agencies. And that continues this year. We advocate for government policies that support local and organic production and eating at both the federal and state level. We provided strenuous advocacy for the inclusion of small farms in the state's distribution of COVID relief funds. We're part of the Farm to School Network team that's drafting a bill to incentivize purchase of local foods by local schools. We testified on behalf of state legislation for organic land care bills for public lands, particularly school grounds and playing fields, soil health bills, SNAP benefit bills, allocating matching state funds for fresh local produce, and bills banning a number of toxic agrochemicals. How does this uh, toxic agrochemicals relate to climate change? Well, living soils, those that are not drenched with pesticides, herbicides, and harsh synthetic fertilizers host a thriving microbiome and attendant soil invertebrates such as earthworms. When these beans are allowed to flourish, the soil has better capacity compared to chemically treated soils to generate humus, to maintain aeration, and to absorb and retain water. And thus, they have a greater climate resilience and they can even draw down extra carbon from the atmosphere, resulting in carbon sequestration. With carbon sequestration, we see an actual avenue for reversing global warming. In addition to our efforts focused on farmers and legislation, we cultivate public awareness about the benefits of organic practices and local organic eating through education and outreach, often in conjunction with other organizations. We work with organizations dedicated to increasing young people's understanding of skills at growing food. We're sponsors of a lively organic gardening series featuring Ron Christie. We collaborated with Merrimack County Conservation District to bring presentations about organic land care to libraries and to our conference. We present co-sponsor and partner on films and panel presentations on regenerative organic ag agriculture. We offer a large winter conference every year hosting nationally known speakers and numerous workshops on practices related to climate adaptation, soil health, and organic living. We organize a bulk order program that provides um, granite staters with opportunities to buy, to buy discounted um, soil amendments and organic compost so they don't have to resort to climate destructive synthetic nitrogen fertilizer. We're active in soil related projects and grants with six other Northeast organic farming associations, collaborate with Seacoast Permaculture to host book study groups. We have a um, newsletter that reaches three thousand subscribers and a social media presence with 6,000 plus followers. If you want to help restore the climate through food, we have a few simple action steps you might take in six words, eat and or grow local organic. 
and expanding that a bit, support local organic purchasing at both the personal and institutional levels, support programs that teach people about food, growing and ecology, support politicians and policies that benefit small scale diversified farmers and processors in local and regional food sheds, join organizations such as NOFA New Hampshire, Slow Food, your local county, um, your county conservation district, New Hampshire small and beginning uh, farmers, permaculture groups, et cetera. And finally, there is a spiritual and psychological dimension here that can be helpful. If you want to restore the climate, appreciate your belonging in this wondrous 4.5 billion year old earth community and show your gratitude by adopting a way of living and eating that is respectful of other humans, life forms and the planet itself. Thank you so much. Um, so feel free to ask questions. If you'd rather type your question in the chat, that's fine too. Um, and I'll turn it over to Chris. All right, so at this point we are scheduled to do some question and answer. And so we've got the four speakers. Um, I know I have a question and I can go first, but uh, I haven't seen anyone type any in other than when will the 22 page report be issued? Jen, do we know that? Are you talking about Jacob's report? Yes. It's available on our website now. Okay, great. Yep. And um, so we'll make Jen does have a question there below that. Um, so to Ellen's production and supply chain stats include processed end product and value added food or just raw inputs? Yeah, the- oh, seven she just point, answered it. That's okay. So the 7.5 billion uh, produced pounds is just raw prior to being processed. However, the inflows and outflows uh, circles, that 71.1 billion uh, outflow, that does include, that because, because that's freight uh, weighed poundage, it also includes processed foods, food manufactured, um, and, and it would also include any the, the, the weight of packaging because that food flows data comes ultimately from the Agency of Transportation's Commodity Flow Survey. That data set is used by the Agency of Transportation to assess uh, every five years the amount of trucks and the, the, the impact of trucks and rail and air uh, on our nation's infrastructure in the transport of food. Cool, thank you, Ellen. Sure, Ben. All right, not, um, and then this is a question for Rob. Did the New Hampshire and National Agriculture Bills address small scale farmers and access by first generation and BIPOC farmers? Um. Yeah, I can look into uh, that more closely, but I do think that um, the approach of the administration is very much focused on addressing or redressing uh, sort of traditional um, uh, you know, what what hasn't what hasn't been addressed in terms of the BIPOC uh, community. You know, overall, the the climate programs are sort of set aside and a real commitment to have at least 40% of these investments going to frontline, fence line, uh, BIPOC communities. Um, you know, I think it's significant that we now have at the Department of Energy, a first time position where you have a director of equity. Um, and I, I'm interested to know um, how such an effort might be uh, part of the Department of Agriculture. And I think it fits into this whole all of government approach around climate and um, and bringing equity to the fore. So I think that's a good opportunity to make sure something like that happens. And one thing I would add is I know that the relief bill that was just signed yesterday by the uh, president also had $5 billion um, set aside for black farmers in particular. And it was very historic in, in that nature. Um, there's gotta be a better article than I put in because the Washington Post has a paywall. But I will I will post that as well. Um, given that we have, uh, does anyone want to try to throw out a question given the, uh, small number of into Sherry. Sure. Thanks, Chris. Jessica put this in the, um, chat as well. One thing I, I work at, with regional adaptation groups around the state. And one of the things we're talking about is climate migration and people moving into Northern New England from areas out West or 
or Caribbean areas where the climate is making it almost impossible to live, either fires or heat or flooding. And so I want to have a conversation about where these people move to, because I'd hate to see our prime agricultural lands be developed to allow for more people moving into the state. And there was an NP NHPR um, coverage about this, and they were talking about Nashua, and Nashua is fully built out. So the only way they're gonna have more people come in is to increase density. So that's fine for a city, but I live in a rural area, and I'm afraid that my prime agricultural lands are going to be taken for housing, for refugees. And I don't want to be exclusionary, but I just want to have them be in a place that doesn't affect our future ability to grow. That's a really that good means... point, Sherry. And it's definitely happening uh, here in Vermont, uh, where what we're seeing that the people that can migrate are the uber wealthy. And so they're, they're coming in, they're buying uh, farms. In many cases, uh, they could be dairy farms, they could be any number of farms. They're setting them up as estates. Uh, where they're not going to be uh, keeping that land in production, or they might uh, lease it out. But then you got this really weird power dynamic of like indentured servitude almost to the point. Um, so I do think it's a really relevant question and something we need to move very quickly in understanding. It also, uh, it really brings to the fore the importance of the American Farmland Trust recent report that came out a year ago to talk about how do we conserve more farmland uh, for the purpose of farming? And how do we ensure that we have people that get on that land that actually are going to, uh, to farm it? So how can we uh, assist BIPOC uh, individuals of getting on farms? How do we make that accessible um, and able to get the kind of loans that are needed to, to acquire that land? How do we get that land to be more affordable in general? And ultimately, how do we conserve and protect it for its, for its highest and best purpose, which is growing more food? So these are really essential questions and things are moving very fast. Um, you know, you also are seeing in the northern part of, of, of Maine, for instance, a number of, of Chinese equity firms that are buying up large tracts of land. So this is a serious issue that we've got to come to grips with. And as you say, it's not about being exclusionary. It's about how do we protect this finite resource that we have, because if we're going to strengthen our food system, and regionalize it, we, we, we have to start with the land base and, the, and also the, our seas, uh, the ocean uh, uh, productivity uh, that needs to get rebuilt. Um, so th this is an absolutely essential question that we've, we've got to come together around. And, and, and so this and is I would what add just on a, on a point about um, um, leasing land or allowing farmers on to, to privately held land or conservation easements, et cetera. You know, the farmers I've spoken to, you know, they still struggle even with good relationships because many landowners, many, many homeowners who have that land and say, sure, I'm gonna lease this out to a farmer. They kind of just want open meadows and fields. Please just hay this. Where, you know, we need some hay, we also need food production. And that needs to be addressed as we, we address that challenge. I know we're, we're running short on time before we, we get to the closing, um, but some of the things that we're seeing, it, like this is a great conversation that talks about all the different things that um, are nested within one another or related to one another in kind of an ecosystem of issues. Um, as Sherry well knows, there are concerns about conservation of farmland, but also uh, renewable generation. Um, in my community, they didn't want to see industrial, quote unquote, solar panels put on um, farmland, even if it was uh, land within a farm that couldn't be used for any other type of production, even if it could have created a uh, net uh, revenue that might have made that farm more uh, attract not attractive, but uh, profitable. Um, but we're also then seeing um, just affordable housing issues pop up around the state. We have about a month's supply of um, housing at, as people are moving in. There's been a building boom. And so that's a crucial issue that affects both building codes, but also this land access issue. And then on the other side um, of the land issue, um, we have a question of, you know, how do we preserve forests and to what degree do we preserve forests? Um, because the standing timber and the soils are uh, with a sink and a storage for carbon dioxide and they provide a significant asset to the state. But at the same time, clearing that land could provide renewable energy sites or, um, areas where uh, 
agriculture could occur. So there's all of these different competing interests. And I think perhaps maybe looking at it from a regional perspective may be one of the best options because New Hampshire may not be the best suited for growing all of its food because it is so heavily forested and it is providing a net um, benefit to the globe as a whole by keeping carbon. Whereas there may be areas of Maine, Massachusetts and Vermont that have more open space that we do we boost that. Now that might be committing a little bit of heresy on this call because it's focused on New Hampshire. Um, but like, how do we nest all of these conversations together to get the best possible outcome? That's a really important point, Chris, and definitely some uh, a piece of the, the a big piece of the work that we are in, we are gearing up to do in setting milestones. It is really looking at each of the six states. You know, the southern six state, the southern three states have the primary have have a lot of the eaters of the 14.5 million of us, and whereas the northern uh, three states have more land. But as you say, New Hampshire has got a lot of forest land, as does Maine. But there's more opportunity to expand production for of, of, of crop grown and livestock, for instance, in, in Vermont and in Maine. So what's the what's the ratio of the increased food production that happens in, in, in Maine and, and Vermont versus say New Hampshire or Massachusetts or and where in Massachusetts? Like all of that needs to get sorted out and overlays with where available. Uh, land is for production, um, and then you know where, what's the infrastructure needed to support that? How many acres in each of the states? How much additional pr processing capacity would be needed? How much storage capacity would be needed? All those kind of questions then flow once you start uh, really looking, diving into looking at product categories and and what we could be producing and for which markets uh, and and for what people want to be eating. Uh, in terms of cultural appropriateness, uh, for instance, with uh, our very large uh, BIPOC population across the six state region. And actually, Ellen, I think that ties in with a comment that I was, I put in the chat about urban agriculture. So urban agriculture um, is a really important part of the equation. And from back of the envelope calculations that I did several years ago, it can actually produce quite a lot of food, but um, it often leads to gentrification. And so the very people who it's there to serve um, and help often get squeezed out. So when we're thinking about this work and we start to incorporate or figure out how to include urban agriculture, I don't know how you get around that, but that's certainly part of the equation. Looks like there's lots of other comments in the chat. Feel free to yeah. jump in. So um, Jen, we've got five minutes left. Um, do we want to close or keep going with the questions? Um, well, there are some several good comments in there. Any any last thoughts before we wrap I mean, up? The, the questions that I'm seeing, and it seems that Amelia is, is handling herself pretty well in there, but um, it, are, how we're we using methodologies to determine what can we produce, how can we produce it, um, and how much that would represent. And maybe this is the question to Ellen because you, you have the work that you guys have been doing and you've got the goal set out. Um. Yeah, so um, so Brian Donahue, those of you may know him, works at Brandeis University and he was a principal author of the Wildlands and Woodlands Report and was a principal author of the New England Food Vision document. So number crunched both of those. So we're anticipating uh, having him very much a part of the work that we're doing. And, uh, and there's been a lot of conversations that have been led by Tom Kelly and at the FSNE crew talking about bringing together the, the, the woodlands and the forestry community and now the, the ag and fisheries community. Like that integration needs to, there's more work to be done there and we're just getting started with it. But um, Tom maybe can speak to the, the way that, that they're thinking about um, these integrations. And we're definitely gonna be, uh, looking at that when we start uh, doing our state-by-state -state analysis. Yeah, Ellen, I'll just say thanks for uh, referencing that. Um, uh, those two things, Wildlands and Woodlands and the F New England Food Vision have actually been linked from the very beginning. And the New England Food Vision was written uh, honoring the Wildlands and Woodlands goal of maintaining 70% forest cover in perpetuity in New England. For, and it's all uh, about underlying ecosystem health, 
uh, natural resilience and through Food Solutions New England, we're extending that into the coastal fisheries. So we see a kind of landscape seascape um, scale that is thinking coherently about the underlying ecological health as well as the, the production. So I guess I, Chris, I don't know if there was any last thing you wanted to say and then I'll remind folks about our upcoming discussions. So I, I think I would close in, in noting that it, it, with respect to the climate resilience team um, and, and in hearing this discussion, one of the things I'm interested in is, um, you know, what sorts of things do you as a group that maybe haven't fed into NOFA, haven't fed up to Rob, haven't fed to Ellen or, or myself representing the climate resilience food system team, um, might you or your organization think needs to be addressed? What might have been overlooked and is a, just a, a huge gap? And then, you know, put that in the notes and we'll make sure that we're reviewing that and getting that to the right people. Um, but maybe also be thinking, I personally think is interesting is what are the different intersecting issues that we need to consider? It's like if you hyper-focus on food too much without recognizing that renewable energy, affordable housing, access to land, and then the pressure of climate migrants, um, not to use it as a pejorative, but just as a real thing. Um, I'm here because I couldn't live in Maryland. Um, I grew up in Vermont. It was too hot in Maryland. And the, I can imagine other people are going to be doing the same thing. Um, and we are already seeing that. So like, what are the intersection, intersecting um, issues um, that we may need to consider that I think bringing those to policymakers in the future may be helpful because working on affordable housing may increase the coalition. If the food movement is coming in to talk about affordable housing, that may help policymakers hear it from a different angle, hearing renewable energy from a different angle, hearing forest preservation, um, hearing about the, the ocean preservation and support for the entire system may require a much bigger coalition um, such as is represented here um, on, on this particular call. But understanding those different connections may come from each of you uh, presenting your view of the world so that we can see it in a way that maybe we're not seeing it from our individual seats. Thanks, Chris. And thank you, Ellen and Edith and Rob for presenting and everyone for being here. So great to hear about all the work happening in the region. Take care, everybody.